Welcome back to STTPML, So That the Peoples May Live. We're now on Module 3, continuing our discussion about treaties. Okay? To recap, remember something that only nations can make treaties. And remember also that a nation is defined by facts on the ground and law, not by whether it's recognized by anyone or not recognized by anyone. It's a matter of facts. And we said before, group of people, a common historical land base, a common economic life and history, uh, a, a system of governance that defines membership in the group, and a common culture and language. Okay? Now, this is important because of where we're going. We said before that a treaty binds a whole population to its terms over time. So when a treaty is made a hundred years ago, or 200 years ago, unless that treaty has been repudiated and repealed, if it's still in force, if it's been ratified, then the terms of those treaties are binding on all generations after that treaty. What does that mean? Well, it means this. If treaties can only be made by nations, and if treaties can only be kept by nations, then any treaty that, a, a, that purports to abolish one party to the treaty as a nation, as part of the terms of the treaty, violates the canons of treaty construction. How can a government be kept, a governing a government be allowed to sign a treaty and keep the terms of the treaty, but the nation that's supposed to do it is what been abolished as a nation under the terms of the treaty? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. So that's why when one nation makes a treaty with another nation, each side re recognizes its governance, its system of governance, and its capacity, its authority to keep the terms of the treaty. So the reason I'm getting into this is because when you read the Fort Laramie Treaties, 1851-1868, when you read the Lamewell Treaty, 1855, part of them talk about one group of people being dependent upon and under the authority of another. It's a contradiction. It's up to this nation and its system of governance to keep its terms of the treaty it's up to this nation and its system of governance to keep the terms of its treaty. One nation that says the terms of the treaty is you are to keep the terms of the treaty and by the way, we will be the ones enforcing the terms on you as well as on ourselves. We don't recognize anymore your traditional system of governance. That can't happen legally under the canons of treaty construction because only nations can make and keep and bind their populations to the treaties. This is important because when we get into Fort Laramie Treaty, for example, when we get into 19, 1868, for example, you see, from this day forward, all war between the parties to this agreement shall, ever, shall forever cease. The government of the United States desires peace and its honor is pledged to keep it. The Indians desire peace and they now pledge their honor to maintain it. But then it goes further to talk about if there are bad men among the whites or the Indians, the, the authority to sanction either the Indians or the bad white people rests with the U.S. government. What that means is one nation is purporting to define and to punish and to keep and to sanction breaches of the terms of the treaty, irrespective of what the other nation understands and irrespective of the other nation's own system of traditional governance. Because if you look at the names on the Fort Laramie Treaty, for example, 1868, and they're spelled out phonetically, okay? Iron Shell, Red Leaf, Black Horn, and they're all signed with an X. You see? 
These are the authorities of the Lakota. Not the American government. They have their own authorities. <coughs> These are traditional Indians. Lakota signing this treaty. Who were, the leadership was produced from a what? From a system of governance. A traditional system of governance. What does that mean? It means what some people call chiefs, which we don't really have. We have leaders. We don't have really chiefs, per se. That's somebody else's term. It includes the councils of elders. It includes the bundle holders, the pipe carriers, the medicine people. Those are the ones who make up the traditional systems of governance, along with the clan mothers, among other nations, because most of them, most, not all, but most are matriarchal. And the clan mothers, for example, have a lot of influence in the governance systems, for example, amongst the, the Six Nations, as an example. You see? But the point is, our leadership, our system of governance, is not the same as the American system of governance. And so, this is where we're getting into now when we start to get into these treaties. And this is why we're starting off this series to be very, very clear about what treaties are and what property rights are. Because you see, treaties, you notice what I read to you is about war and peace. But treaties are also about property rights. Okay? You see, if I steal a sandwich from you or a watch or something else, it's, it's not really distinct. I'll probably get away with it. But when we're talking about land and other forms of durable property, then according to capitalist law, property rights exist on the following basis. What are called allodial title. That has to do with discovery. In other words, a lodial title means the original occupants who utilized and who roamed and who lived on a given area as part of their traditional homeland. They have what's called original or a lodial title. Okay? The second way is purchase or bequest or gift. But in all three of these cases, there has to be legal title on that which is being bought, that which is being inherited, or that which is being gifted. You don't get to legally purchase and keep or, re or get willed to you or gifted to you stolen property. That should be obvious. And there's one other way that property is acquired original property, and therefore becomes legal, property legal to sell or bequest, bequeath, or to gift. And that is just war. But the operative word here is just. Go ahead. Or to claim the land is abandoned. Correct. Correct. But, but, but when we say the land is abandoned, that still will probably get something in close to a lodial title, or it requires some kind of legal action, right, to, to prove that it's been abandoned. What about the trail of tears when they got the people to, right. to appear that it was abandoned? That's where we get into just war, because that was an act of war. The, the trail of tears was directly, and when you read 
the documents of the time, it's very, I mean, they didn't even hide it. They were, they understood what defines a nation. They understood it very well. Remember, what defines a nation goes back. If you want to know where the international law comes from, it goes back even to the conquistadors. Okay? The Spanish and the Portuguese were the, you know, among the first colonizers were also the first to recognize that once we steal the land, or whatever we steal, we have a problem, and that is, what if somebody steals it back using the same exact means we used to steal it in the first place? War, conquest, infected blankets, whatever. And so the requirement is just war. The, 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 the Trail of Tears and the forcible relocation of the Jalagi, the Choctaw, right, and there, there were other nations involved, was directly aimed at taking them away from their land base, splitting them up as a defined group of people, because like the British, you see, well, like the British, the Americans learned from the British very, very well. When the British were losing their empire, they're sort of like the guy who catches his, his, his partner in the sack with some other person and says, if I can't have her, nobody will. So what the British did was when they left India, because they were bankrupt, not because the Indians drove them out. And when they left other places, guess what they did? They left splits in land. And they put people, nations, that had had historical problems with each other, next to each other to fight, in order to promote divide and rule, in order to break up the traditional economy of indigenous people, in order to rewrite the history of indigenous people, in order to break the system of governments of indigenous people, in order to break up the membership and divide the membership, and in order to destroy the culture and the language of those people. Starting with what? Removing them from their traditional historical land bases. Because anybody who knows about indigenous people knows that indigenous people, first and foremost, focus on the land. The land ain't for sale. And we're going to get into that too. Well, they, if, if, if the Indians didn't have property rights the same way as the whites, then they didn't really give up anything by having their property stolen from them because they didn't recognize private property anyway. That's, that's not the issue at all. We're going to get into that issue in detail, okay? We're going to get into that issue. But right now, it's important that we're on the same page in terms of understanding what treaties are under the law, what they do, and what they require to be kept. And what they require to be kept is what? A viable nation with its own institutions. Okay? We are not happy about the American system of government. As a matter of fact, a lot of Americans weren't really happy with the American system of government. It's basically for sale. It's basically a bunch of guys getting money to pimp particular bills for those who give them the money. So it doesn't, most indigenous nations are not happy about the system of governance of the United States, particularly when it's predatory and when it means the genocide. But for purposes of treaty, we don't quarrel with American system of governance because that's American people's business. It's American people's business what kind of system of government they evolve and accept and legitimate. But it's our business not theirs. What kind of system of governance we evolve, how we evolve our leadership, that you recognize sign the treaty, that you recognize bound our populations for hundreds of years past the time when the treaty was signed. You don't get it both ways. You don't get to recognize us as a nation authorized to sign a treaty and in the terms of the treaty, abolish us as a nation and abolish our systems of governance, our culture, our language, our land base, and declare yourselves the only ones who will keep the terms of the treaty for both nations and define what the treaties for both nations are. It doesn't work that way. 
not in logic, not in, in fact, not in reality. Okay? And so where we're going next is property rights also. Because although these treaties we were, we're talking about here, and we'll be discussing in, in detail, the Fort Laramie treaties, 1851 and 1868, treaties of the Lakota, and the 1855 Lambeau Treaty. And we'll get into Treaty 7 too, but that's another story. I'm interested, on the Blackfoot side, I'm interested in Lambeau because it recognizes a Blackfoot nation on both sides of the Canadian US border that, by the way, did not exist for hundreds of years when Blackfoot have lived there. This is our traditional homeland, you see. Same with Lakota. There's been some movement of Lakota, and Lakota have split up into Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, but they're all one people. They're all one people. And in fact, if you look at the history there too, just like with our different bands of the Blackfoot, historically they've played one off against the other. Okay? You go into Lakota country here, there's certain reses that are known as Red Cloud reses, other ones Crazy Horse, etc., etc., etc. And that's a proxy for a different way of looking at, at, at sovereignty and indigenous rights and so on. And there's some history behind it too. So, divide and rule, you see? But where are we going next? And I'm going I'm to terminate here at the end of this module, okay? But I want you to, to please remember these arguments that we've presented so far. Okay? Treaties are covenants. Right? They're, all, they're about peace and war, but they're also about property rights. And they're about what? They're about establishing property rights when they're ambiguous or when they're under question or under siege. Okay?